Okay, so let's dive right in to the legal analysis then. So always fun. Always fun. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of miss the Maybe days. Maybe not today. <laughs> yeah, I kind of miss the days of like reading Supreme Court opinions in my like legal history classes when one I was a little bit disconnected from them, you know, they weren't happening right now yeah. and affecting, you know, people around me. Yeah. Um and two like they're often like, you know, well reasoned and impressively like thought through and like factually based arguments. And some of these opinions are just fucking garbage these days. Like, who is writing this? <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's kind yeah. of disappointing. They're garbage and they're, and they're partisan and they're politically motivated. And it's just so blatantly obvious based on the fact that in some cases, there's like the plaintiffs aren't, didn't even consent to be plaintiffs. Mm -hmm. The, you know, in, in one case, it turns out there was like an online troll or something that had sparked mm -hmm. the entire thing. Like it is just insanely bullshit. Yeah. yeah. What they're, they're getting away with. Yeah. They're clearly just picking cases to be able to essentially write legislation from the bench and even yeah. making up whole new legal doctrines. So they get to do that more often than, than previously. And yeah. rather than even, having any type of pretense of deciding any individual case in front of them. They're clearly arguing back from their conclusions. It's just, it's just patently yeah. obvious. So the Supreme Court just wrapped up their 2022-2023 term. And when they do that, they tend to deliver like the key rulings of the year. And I think we talked about a couple of these a few weeks ago. We also teed up a lot of these cases at the beginning of the term. We did put out an episode yeah. talking about the cases that we were kind of paying attention to on the docket that we were a little bit worried about. And a lot of them turned out pretty much as you would expect. <laughs> so, you know, the Supreme Court did make some good, you know, rulings, which, you know, we can get into if we want, although there's plenty of bad rulings that we probably need to dedicate our time to today. But they did some good things. They, they, they you know, protected the uh, Indian Child Welfare Act. They prevented a republican led challenge uh to like like Biden's um you know scale back of of deportation efforts on immigrants they voted uh in favor of uh voting rights for for black alabamans who um were were suing to you know overturn a clearly illegal uh partisan gerrymandered election map um and a whole host of like other you know, a couple of other, actually, a couple of other, like, generally not fucking terrible decisions. But boy, oh boy, did they deliver some gut punches uh, yeah. in their in their decisions at the end of this term. To start out, uh, let's talk about affirmative action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think I should say that the scale of this ruling mm -hmm. is not quite as broad yeah. as some of the headlines make it make it seem mm -hmm. but it is still a fundamental gut punch and it does still demonstrate the fact that the supreme court in a lot of ways is divorced from the reality of continued structural racism yes yeah totally um yeah and it's it's another example of like the court using relatively like rudimentary kind of logic that on its face might seem reasonable but once you yeah. like actually think about the facts that you're, you're being faced with and the nuances of the case clearly kind of falls apart so in making this decision the supreme court has yet again uh you know effectively overturned like 45 years of precedent which that 45 year precedent had been supporting um, the use of racially conscious uh, criteria in college admissions. So just in the last 20 years, the Supreme Court has twice upheld the use of that kind of criteria in college admissions, and to good effect, right? We've seen Ivy League universities have an increasing proportion of non-white students um, and overall like greater representation over time. Whereas states that have outlawed individually the use of race-conscious criteria and admissions, the states that have outlawed that have seen significant decline in 
diversity and representation of non-white students in their public universities. So like, just straight up, we know affirmative action works to increase diversity and representation on campus, flat out. Yeah. Furthermore, one of the things that we need to understand when we're looking at the importance of education is that education is quite possibly the greatest mechanism, the greatest vehicle for mm -hmm. social mobility mm -hmm. in terms of socioeconomic status. As it stands in the United States, over a fifth of, of black people are below the poverty line versus about uh, almost 10% of white people. So double. Mm -hmm. Black people, like twice more black people in the United States live below the federal poverty line than white people. And one of the biggest drivers of social mobility is education. Yeah. See, the issue is, and, and I know that I've made this point before, but the issue is we currently pay for public education with property taxes. Yeah. Which means that if you are in a lower income area, which means that you probably, your, your family probably also has a lower income, your schools are going to be lower quality mm -hmm. because they don't have as much funding. They can't pay for high quality teachers. They can't pay for high quality material. Yeah. They can't pay for a decent space to actually be a positive learning environment, which means that if you grow up in an environment, they can't pay for like, you know, teachers to teach AP classes in addition to the normal required classes, the kinds of stuff that is a direct path to a great uh, education after public school. Yeah, exactly. Which means that a person who comes from an environment such as that will be less set up yeah. to, to, to be able to get into a college because a college is going to look at, you know, grades from, an, from a specific area. And if they don't take into account the fact that this person might have had additional challenges, mm -hmm. then they're probably, then effectively it's going to have the impact of less people who are impoverished getting admitted. Yeah. And black people and Hispanics, by the way, and not just and not just that, but also uh, American Indian slash Alaskan natives, mm -hmm. in which over uh, over a quarter of them live below the poverty line. Mm -hmm. It's going to mean that less of them are going to be able to get into college. The reason why we have affirmative action is to try to equalize that playing yeah. field that is currently not equal to begin with. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Th like, it's. It's so clear when you like lay out. So, so Republicans are constantly making the argument that what this is doing is in a racist way, trying to take people of like less merit. And if you're watching the YouTube video, I'm doing like quotes here, like literally like less meritorious people and, and giving them, uh, you know, a boost. And that argument only makes sense with this, like, most rudimentary silly like definition of merit possible right like yeah like literally if merit equals sat scores then that holds but otherwise it doesn't like think yeah. about it this way two people start a race one starts a race a hundred feet behind the other person and they're gonna sprint right and they start at the same exact time and then that person who starts a hundred feet behind right they make up over that sprint half or or even three quarters of the distance but they don't make up the hundred the full hundred feet right and the other person beats them as a result who's the better runner the yeah. person that started further behind there's actually yeah. merit to overcoming struggle and just the fact that you don't overcome it to the to make you fully equal with someone else doesn't mean that there isn't merit there like the idea that merit that meritocracy is only measured in sat scores is clearly absurd no one actually believes that but they just pretend like yeah. what they're saying like be, they make the argument that like structural racism doesn't really exist and therefore you know all of this has to do with how well you bootstrap and how well you like take care of yourself and how responsible you as an individual are and by putting it all on that individual yeah. they are pretending like uh like these people aren't meritorious which we know is false because we see benefits of beneficiaries, I should say, of affirmative active, uh, action um, systems do well at colleges and universities. We see them yeah. fulfill some of our, you know, highest offices in our country. So we know that it works. 
to get people who are meritorious into colleges and universities. Yeah. And the examples that a lot of right wingers were oft, will often point towards is, well, if racism exists, then why are there black people that <laughs> are rich? Like, why do rich black mm -hmm. people exist? <laughs> and, you know, there's a lot of explanations for that. There's sure. a lot of potential reasons for that. One of them could be fucking affirmative action. Uh, mm -hmm. But also, you know, to, 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 to look at the example that, that Michael gave about the, you know, the starting a race, maybe if you are a hyper amazing, awesome athlete, sure. you can still win. Yeah. And that happens. Yeah. That can absolutely totally. happen. And, and if that does happen, like, holy Great. shit, you are amazing. All right. Yeah. You are absolutely amazing. You should be celebrated. You should yeah. absolutely be celebrated, but you should also not be used as an excuse to yes. keep other people like you at that same starting line. Yes, you still started 100 feet behind. And wouldn't it have been even better if you'd been started from the same footing and you could exemplify your skill even more? Like, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Yeah. There was actually this segment that, uh, that Charlie Kirk did in which he was, he was uh, doing a rebuttal against uh, Joy Reid, Michelle Obama, uh, Sheila Lee, Sheila Jackson Lee, and Katanji Brown Jackson, who were mm. affirmative action picks for getting into college, he was saying, "Oh, well, you know, they keep using themselves as an example of why this is an important program. Well, this is an example of why it's a failed program because mm. these are just mm. a bunch of dumbasses. You know, these are just <laughs> these are just a bunch of dumbasses." Uh, he said. He said, "Quote." Um, they're coming out, they're saying, I'm only here because of affirmative action. Yes, we know. You do not have the brain processing power to Jesus otherwise be taken Christ. really seriously. He also added, you had to go and steal a white person's slot Fuck to be taken Christ. somewhat seriously. Holy shit. Yeah. Like, now, I do want to exemplify the fact that that is such a stupid fucking argument that mm -hmm. I almost didn't want to bring it up in this conversation because mm -hmm. it's so stupid that... I could very, I could very easily be accused of strawmanning the right by hmm. basically casting the right as being like by, by by saying that this exemplifies the the right wing position. But this is a guy with a huge following. This yes. is a guy that regularly goes to college campuses and spouts his fucking garbage. Yes. And like the the point is, like again, it, it goes back to the point that I made earlier. If you were picked for college because of affirmative action. And then when you got to college, you excelled, which the all of which all of these women did. They mm -hmm. excelled in college and were able to have successful careers because of that. Like whether you agree or disagree with their politics, which, you know, in, in Charlie Kirk's eyes, if you if that means like if you disagree, that must mean they have less brain processing power or some bullshit. But like whether you agree or disagree with their politics, they have had successful political careers and they had successful academic careers because they were given a chance. Yeah. All right. The point is not you were picked and then you, you know, flunked out of college. It's we're giving you a chance to actually mm -hmm. have a decent education in college. And if you're able to take advantage of it and do well, then that's going to make you make it so you can do well later in life. All right. And that's what happened yeah. with these women. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. And and I think I think ultimately the schism misunderstanding like not just a misunderstanding, being willfully misunderstanding racism in America and like, and this idea that yeah. like white people are getting yeah. replaced by black people or people of color in these colleges and universities is really the thing that is underpinning the division in the court. So like Chief Justice Roberts uh, yeah. wrote that, that for too long uh, universities have, quote, concluded wrongly that the touchstone of an individual's identity is not... Uh, challenges bested, skills built, or lessons learned, but the color of their skin. Our constitutional history does not tolerate that choice. So basically trying to make the argument that, uh, it's a classic argument we've all heard, affirmative action itself, because it's race conscious, is racist, which is a rudimentary understanding of racism. And I think it's really well refuted yeah. by um, Justice uh, Katanji Brown Jackson's uh, dissent in this case, where she wrote, quote, with let them eat cake obliviousness, today, the majority pulls the ripcord <laughs> and announces colorblindness for all by legal fiat. 
but deeming race irrelevant in law does not make it so in life. And I think that's that's an incredible mm. sentiment, an incredible statement, an incredible refutation of Roberts's and the majority's position, which is just anything that's aware of race is racism. And that is the position arguing from from just like perfectly equal treatment. But ultimately, the point of affirmative action is equity, is recognizing the systematic, systemic challenges that face people and treating them with that in mind. And race, unfortunately, is one of the best predictors of those systematic, systemic challenges. Yeah. Now, to be clear, that that is not to say that if you are black, that always means that you're poor. And if you're white, no. that always means that you're rich. That's a that's a straw man that they like to use. That is not what it means at all. Yeah. What it means is that if you do struggle with poverty and you are black, more likely than not, the color of your skin, the legacy of slavery, the legacy of Jim Crow, the legacy mm -hmm. of redlining, and yep. the current practices within, like the current practices of funding of education, the current practices mm -hmm. of realtors mm -hmm. using implicit bias to mm -hmm. devalue homes that uh, that are owned or thought to be owned by people of color versus white people, which that has been well studied, you can look it up, has an impact on yep. what opportunities you will have. Mm -hmm. If you are black, it is likely that that has an impact on your socioeconomic status. If mm -hmm. you're white, it probably doesn't. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And the and and to to that point as well, none of these colleges and colleges and universities are going like handing out spots based on just race alone. Race is one is is it, these are race conscious decisions, right? It's yeah. one of the many things taken into account, and often it's a very small part of their admissions algorithms. The point yeah. is just to slightly tip the scales in order to account for known, measured, well-documented and understood challenges faced by certain applicants. Yeah. So, All right. <laughs> you want to talk about uh, you want to talk yeah. about the LGBT case? Yes, let's talk about that one next. Yeah, Which this I feel one like there's not as much to uh, say about this one. Oh, I have definitely... so much to say. <laughs> oh, you do have so... Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 All right. for sure. So, at issue in this case is uh, well, we'll be generous to the majority and uh, the plaintiffs in this case. <laughs> At issue in this case is a website designer <laughs> in Colorado um, who allegedly was, you know, uh, asked about uh, creating a website for a gay wedding and refused. And similar to like the Masterpiece Cake Shop um, case, this was teed up as a as Colorado's anti-discrimination law and public accommodation law being held in contrast with other rights of individuals. So in the Masterpiece Cake Shop, it was like, you know, your religious right not to be, you know, made to do things that you don't want to do, basically. And then in this case, it's uh, the court kind of landed on this idea that that as a website designer, you are in a creative service profession such that the things that you make are speech and therefore being forced by the government to uh make a, a you know website for a, a person that you disagree with you're being forced to uh express speech that you don't actually believe and therefore that's a violation of your first amendment rights to free speech that's basically where they landed um so here's why that's bullshit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it's really fucking bullshit. So So first off, the guy who was the the original the, the person who uh they claimed asked her to do a website yep. for a gay wedding. It turns out the actual dude cuz he like he looked, he saw his, his email address on the thing. The actual mm -hmm. dude is married to a woman and yep. never emailed the site and was basically yeah. like, I don't know if they just made this up. Yeah. I don't know if they, like, I, I don't know if uh, someone else just decided to use my name mm -hmm. in, in complaining to them, but 
this ain't me, bro. Yeah. So, so I think that's a huge part about this case. And it's a, and it's a evidence in favor of the idea that the Supreme Court was looking for a case yeah. to try to make a ruling of this type. So yeah, yeah. To, that, to your point, there isn't a set of facts at issue here. This is yeah. a totally hypothetical case because one, <laughs> that no one ever asked this lady to make a website for them in Colorado for their for their gay wedding because this dude is straight has been married for 15 years yeah <laughs> to a woman <laughs> but separately Lori smith the plaintiff in this case doesn't make wedding websites she was thinking about maybe making a wedding website thought that maybe she would be prevented from refusing service to lgbtq couples as a result of the colorado case and therefore sued colorado with no factual basis whatsoever. The standing in this case is entirely hypothetical, which is just not how the fucking law works. Because, <laughs> because laws and cases are intensely factual. You make rulings on the facts of the case. You don't just write them hypothetically. That's what law writing is for <laughs> you write laws <laughs> i'm just i'm so fucking pissed about this i've never thought i'd get so heated over standing but the fact that the court <laughs> was literally looking for a case this is like not even a test case right they were literally just looking for someone that they could write this opinion for because they've already different they've already chipped away at uh equal rights and equal protection in masterpiece cake shop uh by comparing by by putting it in tension with religious freedom and now they're trying to chip away at public accommodation at equal treatment uh by putting it in tension with with first amendment rights neil yeah. gorsuch in the conservative majority opinion uh wrote that the first amendment quote envisions the united states as a rich and complex place where all persons are free to think and speak as they wish not as the government demands the opportunity to think for ourselves and to express those thoughts freely is among our most cherished liberties and part of what keeps our republic strong to force all manner of artists speechwriters and others who, whose services involve speech to speak what they do not believe on pain of penalty is like in this opinion the result of like public accommodation laws applying to people in industries that that serve these kinds of of uh potentially speech related loosely speech related fields yeah so yeah i i want to draw attention to the speech writers part of that yeah yeah like if we were talking about a case where you know there was a there was a speech writer who was being who was liberal who was being hired to write a speech about like conservative shit that would be one thing mm -hmm. but that's not what this is that's not what is in question here exactly, what is in question yeah. is the identity of the person who was asking for it exactly so that speech writer you know they could say like i'm not going to write something that i don't believe in but because if a speech writer has a business in which they are they are serving the public like if, if it is a public accommodation, that is that is yeah. what a public accommodation is. Yeah. And they were to say, I'm not going to raise speech for a black person or I'm not going to raise speech for a gay person. Yeah. At that point, you are violating discrimination laws. Yes. I, exactly. I don't know why two fucking bumfuck podcasters can get it, <laughs> can fucking understand why, why this is not, why speech is not the legal question at issue here. Yeah. So so let's remember, Neil Gorsuch wrote an opinion, a landmark fucking opinion, protecting LGBTQ rights, right? By by clearly articulating in a Supreme Court opinion the very obvious uh, but yet uh, heretofore unarticulated position that to discriminate based on sexual orientation is to discriminate based on sex, right? And discriminating based on sex is federally not illegal because of uh multiple statutes including the civil rights act right but sexual orientation is not necessarily protected but the argument is very clear if you would do a if you would do uh, a service or uh you know provide a service to someone who is a man married to a woman and you wouldn't do it for a woman who is married to a woman 
then it is very clear that that is a sex-based discrimination. Sexual orientation, any discrimination against someone for sexual orientation inherently has to be sex-based. So yeah. I don't know why he can get that. He can understand that. He can articulate that and write it down in a fucking Supreme Court opinion. But he can't get the nuance at play here, which yeah. I'm going to try to illustrate with an example. Okay, you want to play a little game with me? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. All right, Nathan, pretend that you're a homophobic website designer. Grr, I hate gay people. There you go. That was, Make sure you quote that. That was so convincing. <laughs> wow. Um, Make sure you quote that and use it against me later. Yeah. Okay, I... <laughs> I'm a business owner, and my business partner, his name is John, and I come to you to make a flashy website, and it has banners and confetti cannons and a place where people can buy us congratulatory gifts and RSVP to attend our ribbon-cutting ceremony because we are finally, me and my business partner, John, are finally opening our business like we've always wanted. And at the top of the page, I want you to write, congratulations, Michael and John. If you were a homophobic web designer, would you make that website? Grr, no. Why not? I'm just a business owner. Because I hate gay people. I'm not gay. I'm just a business owner. It's just me and John, business owners. I mean, if you're just two business owners, then I guess so. Yeah. I guess I make the website. <laughs> Michael and John's tire repair. Why not? Okay, yeah. so then I come to you, Mr. Homophobic Website Designer. And I'm a business owner. And... I'm with my life partner, John, uh, and I come to you and I want you to make a flashy website. It's got banners and confetti cannons and a place where people can buy us congratulatory gifts and RSVP to attend our wedding because we're finally getting married like we always wanted. And at the top of the page, I want you to write, congratulations, Michael and John. Grr, no, you... I hate gay people. Exactly. It's the same website. It's the same yeah. speech. Therefore, yeah. this is not speech. This is... This is exclusively based on the fact of our sexual orientation. If we were straight yeah. and running a business, you'd make this we could make the same website as if we were gay and getting married. And yet only one of those times you would discriminate against us. Yeah, and I want to and I want to be clear about something. Ask yourself seriously. If at the top of that website it said no interracial weddings, would you be okay with that? Hmm. If at the top of that website it said no Jewish weddings, would you be okay with that? Yeah. If at the top of that website it said no Muslim weddings, would you be okay with that? Uh, I don't know what this woman's religious denomination is, but let's let's assume for the sake of argument that she's Protestant. Mm -hmm. What if it was a Catholic wedding? Yeah. All right? She's not allowed, you know, is she allowed to say Catholics need not apply? You know, is she allowed to say if it's not even an interracial wedding, just like if it's two black people getting married? Yeah. You know, not going to do it. Is that yeah. okay? No, of course it's not okay, because it's discrimination. It yeah. is discrimination based on a protected identity. Yeah. A protected identity that this Supreme Court has affirmed is a protected identity. Yes. That's why the facts fucking matter. That's why it really matters, because, like, Gorsuch and the conservative majority put up a bunch of straw men about, like, trying to play, like, the other side of the coin and being like, well, like, what if it was a Nazi and they wanted you to write pro-Nazi stuff on your website? Like, you don't have to do that. That would be yeah. a question of free speech. That might be something worth litigating. But this isn't a question of free speech. And it's not about whether they're a Nazi. It's about writing pro-Nazi stuff on your website. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, hell, if, Nazi, if two Nazis were getting married and they came to you and they were like, all right, well, we're getting married. Uh, make our website. You make it. They say, write this on the website. You can be like, you know what? I'm not going to write that on the website. Yeah. Also... Just being a Nazi Fine. is not a protected class, not a religion, it's not also a nationality. Not, yeah, yeah exactly. so <laughs> also <laughs> not not an issue here, Neil. So like, yeah. I just I find this case to be so fucking absurd because it is it, it illustrates two really important things. One, as we already talked about, this court is legislating from conclusions and you know finding whatever facts are necessary in the case. And whatever argument is necessary and rationale is necessary to reach their conclusions. But two, and maybe this is more, you know, esoteric of a point, if there are no true facts at issue in the case, it means that these cases are somewhat impossible to analyze deeply. Yeah. You can't fucking understand or know exactly what this case will mean next time. Because all you have is a fucking treatise on free speech and some tenuous relationship between free speech and 
and service industries and LGBTQ people. Because there are no facts for us to really consider, you know, really consider like what this case is confined to, all we have is like dicta. All we have is argumentation. And so there's no option except to recognize that the logic in this case is fucking bullshit and doesn't fucking work. And it will, as the dissent, as the dissent uh, claims, um, the quote symbolic effect of the decision is to mark gays and lesbians for second class status. It will do that. It has done that. It has opened the door to businesses just refusing service to LGBTQ folks. All right, so we've touched on a lot. We've talked about a lot. And as usual, Nathan and I had more to say than we thought. (laughs) So there's one clear case that we're not going to get to talk about this week, which is the Supreme Court, um, you know, blocking Biden's student loan forgiveness plan. There's way more to go into there to talk about the court's ruling and then talk about what Biden can do in response. And so we're going to delve into that in a future episode. (music) 